Welcome back to Wikibon Weekly, presented by The Cube. Uh, this week, once again, we've got Bill Schmarzo, who's the EMC CTO of Global Services in their big data practice, talking to us about some of the trends and uh, changes that are taking place in big data as businesses try to do a better job of applying data to better business insights and models that actually can take action. Now, uh, Bill, as we sit here in Silicon Valley, not too far from Stanford and not too far from so many businesses that are in many respects at the vanguard, because the tech industry is very, very big and using a lot of these technologies, increasingly we're discovering that people are trying to leverage the value of their data by creating models. Mm -hmm. So it's not, we're trying to move away from just a single bespoke approach to gathering data, generating an insight, and then starting fresh we want to start creating models that are capable of supporting not only this action consistently over time, but can be used to support other derivative actions that are tied to that particular decision. How are your customers today starting to think about transitioning from data just as an input to modeled assets comprised of data through analytics that are capable of driving new business behaviors consistently? So we, we're we starting to see more of our customer base starting to build out analytic models. The, the challenge that is that many of these organizations don't have an overarching vision of what that what the analytics could do for them. They, they still treat them as one-off activities instead of as an asset to be utilized and reused, um, which is resulting in a lot of fairly mature um, big data type organizations having what I call orphaned analytics. Analytics that have, there was some business need, um, they, the, the analytics were successful, they addressed that business need, but it only was used once and it was never sort of operationalized. And while that's, you, you get sort of a, an immediate high from that, right, it's just sort of, you know, you've got some value, you don't, you leave a lot of value on the floor because you don't reuse that. So there's, I think organizations who are um, some of the more mature organizations are realizing that we've created a bunch of orphaned analytics and lack an overarching vision because they've, while they may have thought about data as an asset, they haven't thought about the analytics as an asset that can be captured, shared, and reused across the organization. Now, this is, uh, this is crucially important because uh, the, the uh, historical norm thinking about it as an, as, of an asset, yeah. is an asset has attributes of scarcity. I'm going to take this money and apply it to this use. I'm going to take this machine and I'm going to apply it to this use. I'm going to take this piece of real estate and apply it to this use, and I can apply it to multiple uses at once. Now maybe I can apply a building to accounting and HR yeah. and other types of things, but ultimately that asset has high asset specificity, as an economist would say. It is specialized to a particular asset. Now, the weird thing about data is that it doesn't follow those rules of scarcity. Right. Now, it's interesting that historically, we have taken, we've made efforts to try to make data scarce mm -hmm. so that it looks more like an asset, either by how and that we, happens within organizations, by the way. Well, that's what we see data say. silos, right? That's exactly that's right. exactly yeah. right. We use copyright law to protect data, which is okay. We understand yeah. it. But also, we don't share data within the business. Right. That this is my data. This is my my asset. source I'm, of power. I'm going to use it differentially against yeah. you when we start thinking about the politics of the organization. Yeah. So clearly, to make full use of some of these models we're building, we have to start breaking down the barriers organizationally, institutionally of how not only people think about data, but how they work together to share and move and apply data. Amen. So you, you've hit on a really key point. Is the, when I walk into an organization and I see data silos, I know I'm in trouble. Because data silos are the anti-data science. Right? It's the Data science is about leveraging as much data as possible to get a more clear view, view on the operation so I can make better decisions, so I can build you know, better models. And so when I walk into an organization and I see data silos, I know the chances of success there from a broad perspective are very limited. Yeah, they're gonna have pockets of success. They'll, they'll develop some analytics within their space, but it'll never get reused. And you hit on another key point, Peter, is that, is that data as a currency is very different than dollars and people, right? Think about, you know, dollar. If I have a dollar bill, I go into Starbucks to buy a cup of, well, if I go to Starbucks with a bucket with a buck, I can't buy anything. So <laughs> let's say I got $5. And I you go to tip somebody. Yeah, I can tip somebody, but I won't be able to buy anything. So you see, I got $5 to go to Starbucks to buy a cup of coffee. That $5 is used once and then it's gone. 
right? And the same way with people, right? You, we, you can do this, I can do this, but I'm not, I'm not both here doing this and then, you know, in Peoria, Illinois, doing something else, right? I, I'm only, I've, I've got a transaction limitation. I can do one thing at a time. Data doesn't have that, right? As you've talked many times, data has this, this network effect that the, the more data that I can share, the more value it becomes. So it's, it's really, the, the, the value of data is, is, not, is knocking down those data silos, which is a huge cultural issue, right? It's a source of power. The highest paid person's opinion in the organization is gonna hold on to that data. But if I get organizations, we get organizations to realize that that, that data has, has value, um, more value when it's used across more parts of the organization, then you started to crack down those those silos and you started to really help organizations realize that that the that sh that shared value that currency value of data so it's, it's a just builder when you walk in because you, you spend a lot of time with customers and and generating significant returns uh on these on these big data disciplines it suggests that when you walk in and you encounter data silos, that you personally, and, and I think this reflects what the business decision maker has to do, you have a choice. You could either say, accept the constraints and operate within those within that silo, recognizing that the returns are going to be uh, commensurately limited. Right. Or you can turn to someone and say, you know, there's something we could do here to break down the silo and uh, and move. How often do you end up in that conversation to try to get them to see data differently uh, as something that could be shared across the business? So I'm not in a missionary sales. So when I walk into an organization where I see the data silos, um, you know, I don't have enough time in my life to spend trying to help them do that. And we'll walk away. I mean, I think you have to walk away from opportunities that you know you can't be successful. We have, we have very scarce resources on my team, scarce number of data engineers and, and data architects and data scientists and user experience and visualization people, right? We have a limited set. And so it's, it's my responsibility to our business at, at EMC, soon to be EMC slash Dell, to make certain that our resources are being focused on those kind of clients where we know we can have the biggest success and drive the biggest opportunities for growth. And there's all, there, it's, it's not like you're, like you're hurting for opportunities in this. No, they're everywhere. They're everywhere. So, but still, well, I, I'm, I will say that I am more in the business of uh, selling sure. the, the concepts of moving folks down. I'm sure that when you have gone into some of these accounts and you start going through the process of generating the returns that the client expects, the client themselves periodically go bing. Yes. So tell us about when you've seen those moments and uh, what you've learned from those moments. And if you were into missionary selling, how you would translate that into going out and trying to tell the world there's a different way of doing things. The best way to get the bing moment is to have them visualize it within their own environment. So we run these vision workshop projects where we, we typically start with a somebody CIO or somebody in the IT side who sees the chance to knock down these silos, who sees an opportunity to to expand their own business wealth by helping organizations to their own organization to get value from data. And so we, we find we find somebody like that that we've got a really good chance because they're they're on a mission to help either themselves or the company to get more value. And so what we do is in these vision workshops is we basically show them what they could do. We get a sample, a small sliver of their data. Our data scientists spend a couple of weeks and we show them what they could do with the data. And the idea around that is to make sure that not only does the IT folks know what the, what the realm of the possible is, but more importantly, the business people all sudden start realizing if I have access to that data and the analytics, I can make magnitude better decisions across the organization. So it's, you, you've got to, you can tell stories about other companies and what they've done. You can, you can pray to a whole bunch of really smart people in front of them, but it's not real until it's with their own data. And then they go, oh my gosh, I didn't know I could even do that. And that's when that ping moment happens. And, it's, and, it's, and we will be in sessions and you will almost literally hear the pings going off. You see, you see somebody in the room do this. I get it. It happened yesterday. I was in this meeting yesterday, and with a, in, in Denver, and it's a very smart account. They're really good, and we're and we're meeting with. We have we've had our first meeting, which was a CIO and his team, and now they brought in the business users. We had supply chain and manufacturing and procurement and logistics are all in the room, and we're going through our process. And a woman sitting right in front of me, she goes, "Wait a second. and she goes through this scenario of how she would use this data to help them identify their most important young engineers, identify how to keep them, identify. And she went through this entire process to identify the data she'd want to do and all the decisions she'd want to make. And I stopped and I was like, you, she Would got you like it. to teach the yeah, course? <laughs> you got it. And everybody in the room was like, they, when she said it, I mean, for me, it's like, okay, it's interesting. But when she said it and she put it in context of what they're trying to do, 
the, the, it was like the pings in the room were like ding, 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 ding. It was like there's like, you know, Vegas and the slot machines going off. So there, there will be times when somebody, that moment happens when somebody in the business sort of all of a sudden realizes that, oh my gosh, I can do this to change the way I run my business. Then you've got a formula for success. But it's hard to get people sort of to do that envisioning process, to inv really to invest in themselves to do that. So, so I'll tell you, Bill, the, the, uh, the times that when I have had that experience and you know, spending a lot of time over the years with CIOs and, uh, and, and some big data people, but the times where I've seen it is if you, can, if you walk into an account or if you walk into a situation and someone's focused on uh, an operational element of their function, so that they have naturally circumscribed the decision, the data that they need, and everything else to their silo, you're going to have a problem. When you can get them to say, well, let's connect this back to the customer. Let's connect this back to the brand. Let's connect this back to the business outcome in the marketplace. Now, they may say, ah, that's too big for me, and you can understand why they may sure. say that. But when you can start tying them back to those broader questions, the binging starts happening. Or you immediately realize you're talking to the wrong guy. So we, we like to focus on what we call key business initiatives. So organizations are trying, on the business side, are trying to accomplish something. And we like to focus on this nine to 12 month window. And the reason why we like business initiatives is because they tend to be cross-functional. So customer acquisition isn't just sales and marketing. It's probably got customer service and might have finance in it. So it, it allows you to have a broader view of what they need, which is important from an analytic perspective. But from a cultural perspective, it's also important because now you've brought in three or four different parts of the business to help them sort of figure out what they need to do. And so when you target the business initiatives, and we make it all about improving that business initiative, there's a couple of things. First off, get the organizational support. But then probably the most important thing is if somebody in the organization decided that you know, reducing customer churn by 10% is what we're going to go after, somebody in the organization probably associated and put some value around that. That's worth this much to us. And when we can target something like that that's got some sort of known range of value, then all the decisions we've got to make regarding data and the analytics and some of the organizational changes become much easier to bear. Yeah, absolutely, because there is that... There is that concrete statement of what the value is and everything, and you can pull that thread through the entire process. Which, by the way, is the exact opposite way which most vendors sell and most IT organizations approach, right? They, they go out and they buy some technology. They, they go get some version of Hadoop. They, they throw some data on there. They hire some data scientists, and they hope that something happens. And even if they find something, it's no guarantee that the business people are going to respect what they find. Well, you know, that's a great point, Bill, because, uh, and I, I do want to talk about this notion of models and some of the technologies, but at the end of the day, these are just tools. I mean, we could do everything we're talking about on, you know, with abacuses and paper. It might take, you know, a, a, an infinite number of monkeys and an infinite number of times to do it, but you could probably do it. But there are tooling that makes it easier or not. But the two elements of this have to be not only being able to bring the data in, build the models, and apply it to the decisions, but also, from a technology person perspective, understand how all of that is going to flow to the right person at the right time so the action actually takes place. Yes. Yes. You, you've got to think, even in the early phases of envisioning, you have to think about how do you operationalize it. How, and, and, and in most cases, we find that the, the people who we're trying to make more effective are humans. It might be a teacher, a a physician, a nurse, a parole officer, a engineer, a technician, and we need to think early in the process about how are we going to deliver the insights to them in order for them to do their jobs better. So the operationalization of the entire process isn't something you wait to the end to do. In fact, you'd like to bring those people into the process early because they probably know things about their work environment that no one else does, right, because they live it every day. And so bringing those people into the process, even in the envisioning part, ensures you that when you get to the operational phase, which is where really the rubber meets the road and all the money is, value is realized, you can, you can successfully execute yeah, on that. You've all those, you, you, you have incorporated what is really important to the overall design of the solution. Yes. Which is someone doing something different. Yes. So let's talk a little bit about technology. Now, I, I, know, you're not, uh, I, know, I know you're not a guy that goes out there and comments on Spark or this or that or other thing. But you are very, very familiar with the technologies that people are using uh, and the complexity that those technologies are engendering. Uh, I was, uh, not too long ago, uh, having a conversation with a head of analytics at a large bank who basically said, 
uh, I am now in a position where I cannot differentiate all these open source tools because they all look like they're doing the same thing to me, but they're saying they do something different. How is complexity in the tool set uh, starting to constrain or put a cost on this natural flow of moving from decision out to action? So you've raised a problem that I, we're seeing across a lot of organizations, especially organizations that take a technology first approach. If you start off with a technology first, so you go out and you, you, you spend a number of months figuring out which version of Hadoop to get, and then as soon as you get it in and you get it installed and you get it operational, somebody says, oh, we should, we should be using Spark. Oh, okay, so off they go chasing their tail on Spark, and then somebody comes out and says, no, you need Flink. Oh, okay, let's go this way. So, the, the challenge is, is, is if you think the value in the big data conversation is in the technology, you will forever be chasing your tail. Because like you said, there's a plethora of new tools. Heck, while we've been sitting here, it's probably been some, <laughs> some startup garage two blocks away has created a whole new tool set that we didn't even know about yet, right? So what we advocate to our customers, this sounds kind of weird coming from a technology company, is that look at your technology as being disposable. That you, that if, if long term the value isn't in the technology, it's, you know, we talked in a previous, segment about you know what's the intellectual capital of the big data world well it's the data the analytic models and the decisions you're making i didn't say technology anywhere and so you should, as an organization those are the three things you're going to keep and grow long term the technology might come and go you may have to throw out hadoop in two or three years because it's replaced by spark it gets replaced by flintstone it gets replaced by barney rubble right who knows right so so if you if you think about the technology as being disposable It'll allow you to embrace the, the, the fact that it's not the key asset, and, and, but the key assets are elsewhere. And hopefully it'll help organizations to focus their resources on the places where there's, there's, the, the data sustains forever, right? We, we've got data sets out there that were probably created originally using CICS systems, right? Data sustains, right? The technology doesn't. So the sooner I think organizations realize that technology is only a means to an end and could be treated as disposable, I think the better off organizations are going to be. Yeah, we totally agree with you. At the end of the day, from our perspective, what customers need to do is emphasize the impacts and then take a look at technology as either facilitating or impeding that impact from a cost and effectiveness, learning, training, but especially time to get the impact. Perspective. And I think organizations will start focusing more on building out technology frameworks than they are building out technology. And I think the classic 100%. example is a data lake, right? Data lake is, is, is not you know, a server with Hadoop on it. That's not a data lake, right? There's a, there's a bunch of really important stuff around it for cataloging and metadata management and data governance and all kinds of things that surround that. And if you think about it as a framework, then when those underlying technologies become obsolete or replaced with something else, you've kept that framework and replaced those aspects with things that are better. Right, so you've got a pipeline that you're managing, which becomes, quite frankly, is become, becomes an, uh, a, a central element in many respects to the model. That's not to say that the technology is bound to the model, or the model is bound to the technology, but understanding how the model is generated from sources, how transformations take place, where the data gets stored, where the data gets located, how the data gets applied, is a crucial element of the model. Yes. What's, what's interesting, Peter, is that as, you, as we think about what's going on in this space here, some of the really leading, or, leading edge organizations are realizing from a technology perspective, they're more concerned about two really important aspects. Agility, right? The ability to, to change and de risking the solutions. They want to de risk. They, if you have a chance to deliver something that's got to have a hundred million dollar impact annually because of advanced analytics, the technology you build it on, you want to make sure that stuff works. And, and the cost of that technology is a lot less concern as much as the risk of being successful. So we're going to see organizations, I think, over time, start realize that the technology. Agility becomes everything, this framework becomes everything, but I've got to be able to de-risk that so I can make sure I can deliver on the, on the potential of these analytics and analytic models. Well, a, 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 a mission that I've been on, going back to mission selling, a mission that I've been on, especially since the cloud's been introduced, is to not think about elastic technology. Elastic technology says doing the same thing at different scales, but plastic technology that says you can, do, you can do the same thing at different scale, but as you accrete experience and, and gain insight, you also can very flexibly adjust you can morph what the technology does in a way that it reshapes in a permanent way so that you can carry on in the future and that becomes your new baseline. I think we like need that. to talk about plastic cloud, plastic big data, plastic technology implementations because it provides not only scale, 
but also reshaping and restructuring. So when, you, when I think about <clears throat> plastic clouds and plastic data lakes, things like that, the first thing that comes to mind is a TV series called Botched. With, um, I'm not sure if you've watched it. My daughter, unfortunately, watches it way too often. About it's about plastic surgery gone awry. Oh. It's pretty pretty scary. Actually, I, some it's pretty scary. It's there's it's scarier than a lot of scary movies. I I've I'm not admitting to watching the show. <laughs> and, and I think about how important it is um, to make sure you know what what the end in mind is. And the end in mind is not the technology. The technology just to support that. So you don't want to have a botched sort of infrastructure. Right. You want to make sure your infrastructure is in place to support that end goal, whatever the business initiative is, so that you have that plastic kind of approach that can be morphed to meet what that need is. Bill, that's an ugly, <coughs> pun intended, metaphor. Thank you. All right, so let's, <laughs> let's close this segment of uh, Wikibon Weekly and the Cube. Again, Peter Burris with Bill Schmarzo, CTO of the Big Data Practice and EMC's Global Services Group. Uh, from Silicon Valley, thank you very much, and we'll talk to you soon.